Good morning. How's everyone doing today? Good. I feel like um, I was feeling very comfortable with this presentation, and then we those two this morning, and I feel like the bar is now really high, so I'll do the best I can. My name is Duncan McCreary. I am the Chief Product Officer at MemberClicks. We're down in Atlanta, Georgia. I always like to do this before I give a presentation to people that I don't work with. How many people have heard of MemberClicks before? Okay, so that's better than I did last year. That's good. Um, I think it's actually tripled since this time last year. So um, a couple of things about today. We're talking about next level launches. And when we think about next level launches at MemberClicks, we really think about that whole cycle. You can't have a bad product and development process and then pull a rabbit out of your hat and have a beautiful launch. So this whole thing is about how we are using Pendo to equip our product process from discovery through building through validation, the whole nine yards, and how in the past almost two years since we've been using Pendo, how we've really been able to drive much more product success by making a few small you know, changes and just being disciplined about our process. So we'll go through that. I wanna first give you some context about member clicks. One of the things that I love about this product conference is there's so many things that are similar that we can all relate to but then so many things are very contextual based on your customer, based on your company, based on your culture. So I wanna give you a little bit more information about member clicks so you have that context in, in which we operate. And then we'll go through the whole cycle and actually walk through it. And I've got two examples that are pretty basic. They're not the most complex, sophisticated, earth shattering features that we have, but I feel like they're really approachable for a setting like this for people who don't have intimate knowledge of our uh, product. So first things first about context. A little bit about me. Uh, this is me and my family. You can see we actually had um, snow in Atlanta this year, which like always rocks our world. It usually makes national news. I don't know if we made national news this year, but uh, we all remember Snowmageddon a few years ago. Uh, Christy, my wife, the little guy in front is Will, and uh, Maggie, our daughter, is in the back. And you can tell that we don't get a lot of cold weather in Atlanta because he is definitely wearing his sister's hat. <laughs> Tough life. I'm a little brother too, so I get it. All right, uh, member clicks. We have been around since 1998, and so when I tell people that, like we're a software company since like right, <laughs> you're like, oh my goodness, that's old. Um, so there's that. I have been at member clicks since 2008, so I am one of the old guys in the room in a in a pretty old software company, a SaaS company. We have 120 people in staff. Uh, when I was at Pendemonium last year, I had a very similar slide and we had 50 people on staff. So we're definitely in this growth phase. Uh, over 3,000 customers, we have three offices. Atlanta is headquarters, uh, Indianapolis, Indiana, and um, Vancouver, British Columbia is the third. We are very, very focused on people. Uh, that is true in our customers, that isn't true internally, and I think you'll see that as one of the themes as we talk about our process, how much we really, really work to connect with people build relationships and how for us that really sets the foundation of a better product experience. I'm doing everything I can not to say product love. I don't want to like steal that, so I'll say product experience. Okay, so what our product does. Our product does a lot of things. We are an association management software. Uh, is anyone part of a professional association or the company's part of a trade association? A couple? Okay. So if you think about even an alumni association from you know, your high school or from your uh, college experience, there's a couple of things that associations do that are pretty common. If we're gonna pay membership dues, we're gonna do annual conference registration, might have an online community, websites. We work with small associations. So we take all of those core things and we put them on the same platform, automate a lot of things, and um, take the administrative burden off. When I say when we work with small organizations, I'm talking like five staff members. So for anyone who's ever had that startup, small company experience, time is at a premium, our product gives people their time back. It gets them out of access databases, it gets them out of Excel, puts everything under the same roof. Culturally, we talked about having mission, we talked about good missions and bad missions. I don't know if Wade would say this is a good mission or a bad mission. I feel like I'm vulnerable putting our mission up on the screen now. Uh, but empowering member-based organizations to thrive through refreshing technology and a heart for service. Refreshing technology and a heart for service. We have this mantra in the office, you think software as a service. So there's two parts of it. There's software and there's service. I was on the technology side of it, our job is the refreshing technology. 
for us to create re refreshing technology, we have to know people really, really well and to know what they're expecting and to know where they're struggling and to provide that moment of refreshment. In these small staffs, it's chaos. Like I walk into one of our customers' offices and they're getting ready for an event tomorrow and there's boxes of name tags uh, stacked up. People are trying to field phone calls, process registrations. The Pendo team knows how crazy it is. Actually, Wade just walked in to judge my mission. <laughs> uh, it, it, gets, it gets crazy. And so what we are trying to do is to bring order and safety in all of that chaos, and that's what we think of as refreshing technology. So enough about member clicks, that's just a little bit of background. Um, as product people, who is, who's a product manager in the room, right? Have you ever felt like this, right? <laughs> um, we think about all of the information that comes across our desks every day, right? T getting input from sales all the time, getting input from support all of the time, talking with customers, hopefully, all of the time. And you get all of this information. And sometimes, it, like, you wake up and it's all in perfect alignment and it makes sense and you have direction. But in my experience, that's pretty rare. Mostly, it's cognitive dissonance and you're being torn in these different directions and you got to make really, really hard decisions, which is good because as product people, that's why we have jobs. Like if anyone could walk into the building and set direction and make decisions and it was really, really easy, uh, we wouldn't have jobs. But the most important thing that we do is decide what to build. And that's the start of any good, healthy product process. So this is the process that we follow and it looks very linear and it looks very organized only in this slide. Um, my, my team would like laugh at this. Uh, we've gone, I mentioned the growth phase we're in. Uh, I was the, the product team this time last year. We now have a team of seven. So it's changed quite a bit. We've onboarded a lot of people on the product team. And the first two weeks they walk in and they're just, their jaws drop when new people start. Because there's all this activity, everything's running concurrently. It, it feels chaotic in a day-to-day -day basis. And but when you actually get in there and understand the rhythms, you see a process that, that kind of looks like this. And I don't have the proportions here, but it is without a doubt, that I've been in this role for about the last five years, without a doubt, the most important thing that we do and the thing that sets the whole project up for success is discovery. So we're gonna start there. We think about discovery in two phases. We think about general discovery and we think about feature specific uh, discovery. When we're thinking about general discovery, we are looking for the next big idea. We are looking for the things that our customers stay up at night thinking about. We are thinking about their strategic plans, their objectives, what they are trying to accomplish as an organization, what our customer's mission is. It takes a lot of work to bring semblance to all of that information because there's so much nuance in people's individual goals and organizational goals that you really have to talk to a lot, a lot, a lot of people to understand it at an intimate level. So we're using Pendo to aid that process and to really facilitate that process because it helps us better understand whom we're speaking with before we speak to them. Uh, we're big proponents of the NPS tool there is a lot of disagreement and a lot of academic literature about whether NPS is good or bad. I keep it pretty simple. Like, I'm a guy from Cleveland, Ohio, so I don't like complicated things. I'm, I'm a Midwesterner. I look at it this way, and I think Todd and I have a similar philosophy. If someone is saying, no, I don't recommend your product, I don't like that. That doesn't make me feel good. If someone says, yep, 10 out of 10, I recommend your product, that makes me feel good. And all that other stuff in between isn't as important to me. I look at it as a proxy. Uh, to say, how are we doing? Are people happy? Are they not? And all that's telling me is if I'm talking to someone who uses my product all the time and is thrilled with it and would recommend it, that tells me that I'm doing a good job and that I want to find out what they're using, what their expectations were when they started the product, what caused them to buy it. And if that was recent, recently, it's a different context than if it was five or 10 years ago. How has that changed? If I'm talking to someone or I'm, you know, I'm saying, we did a campaign about two months ago now, and the whole idea was let's find out what people are struggling with, why don't they like it? So we immediately went to the NPS tool in Pendo and we pulled all of our high usage detractors. And we pulled that list and we just started scheduling calls. And it was wide open and it's uncomfortable because it's like 
talking to the people who you know, were mean to you in high school, and you just have to have those kind of like, not confrontation, but you know, if, you have a, if you have a user or a customer who isn't having a great experience, it can go one of two ways. It can really be an earful, um, or it can be this really like, magical experience, because when you pick up the phone and you call that person, it demonstrates to them that you actually care. And that can be the foundation of a great relationship. So we're using Pendo to facilitate those kinds of things. The worst feeling in the world is when you call a customer blind and you don't know how it's going to go. And if it's that 10 out of 10 person, that always feels good, but you probably weren't as prepared as you could have been to learn something new. If it's that 0 out of 10 person, it usually doesn't feel good at all. You might, um, for us, you know, we'll, we'll pull a member of our customer success team as part of that cam campaign, or we'll read through their ticket history in Zendesk to see um, you know, what the most recent issue was, if it's more of a transactional experience issue, or if it is something a little bit more thematic. So this is all about being prepared. In a more passive sense, we're also using Pendo to be more transparent with our customers to facilitate better conversations. So this is our uh, guide center, and we've customized it with two little buttons at the bottom, give us feedback and see the roadmap. Give us feedback links out to our feedback portal. Uh, we use ProdPad. Uh, I, I recommend the tool. It's been good to us. Uh, but it's a way for people to give us how they're feeling in the moment or what they're thinking. And ProdPad asks this question, it would be awesome if, and then the customer fills in the blank. That's a really cool way to phrase that question because you get people's optimism and you also capture their struggles all in that same response. And then the second thing we're doing is, this is also through ProdPad, but this is a Pendo guide that is iframing in our roadmap through, uh, that's hosted by ProdPad. And we like this because we're able to foster more transparency with our customers. Our approach is we want to find out if our roadmap is wrong before we build anything, because building things is really expensive. So we err on the side of over-communication and transparency. We've actually, we've started doing this about, oh, I don't know, about six months ago. And I was reading some reviews from our customers on member clicks, or on Captera, rather. And we actually started getting reviews from our customers about our feedback process. And it was like, people are saying, like, they actually care. They actually listen. I love that I can give feedback wherever I am through the product when it is relevant. And Pendo's guides are enabling us to do that. That's helping us have better conversations, but it's also validating that we are building these relationships and getting closer to the customer and being more intimate. So feature-specific discovery. This one is you kind of like the hunt because you either have a, a feature that you're hearing about from all of the qualitative discovery and you want to put some numbers around it, or you're just kind of like in between meetings and you're poking around Pendo and you're looking for interesting things that you just didn't expect. So we'll look at you know, basic things like this. Um, this particular feature usage was kind of poking along and then January 1st it kicked up. We didn't do any marketing. I don't know why this happened. But Pendo is allowing me to go find the people who hadn't used it before January 31st and find out why. You know, maybe there's something in the industry or some external driver for why this particular feature is being used. Uh, maybe the, there was a user group that just started talking about it, any number of those things. But I definitely want to find out why. So we do the little bit more of the hunting game when we're looking at the data for feature-specific discovery. We'll also see things like this. On the left is uh, our accounts and the number of clicks on a particular feature. You see the, the top two are using this feature quite a bit more than everybody else, and that's kind of weird. Like, there's, just looking at it, there's no reason that should be. So we actually will call these customers, and we'll find out how they're using it, why they're using it. Is it something we intended, and it's something that is great, that we didn't um, market well enough, and they just kind of figured it out on their own? Or is it something that we didn't intend, and maybe it's not so good, and we want to steer them in a different direction? Or are they, are they doing something really, really creative that we want to share with other people? So we've had all of these things happen on that feature level uh, discovery. What I think the key is when you're looking through Pendo is having enough qualitative and conversational data from your customers to be able to drill into the features that you know are important. Otherwise, you know, we have two or 300 features tagged and it's just, it's a lot of noise. But funneling what you're looking for through the qualitative data, that's really the first step. 
So start small. When we're doing something new, all of our discovery is about finding the starting place. What is the most basic level thing that we can build to get in front of customers? And that's really hard because it usually ends up in something really embarrassing because there are just simple logical things that are a customer's baseline expectation that we omit from the product in order to facilitate a better conversation. So here's my example. I mentioned earlier, I'm gonna use very, very basic examples. Like this is not the most sophisticated part of our product. It's one of the simpler ones. Uh, but all this is, is a notes tab. And our customers have a lot of conversations, they got a lot of emails. And when we went into the discovery phase for this, people were telling us they needed a better way to track the conversations they were having with their members and their customers and their constituents. Basic CRM functionality, nothing fancy. And so we said to ourselves, okay, so if people need conversation tracking, we know, it's just a basic expectation, it's, a lot, it's not a great leap to say, you should probably be able to edit and delete those notes, right? Like, we get at that basic of a level. But then we're saying to ourselves, well, maybe it's more of an audit trail, and maybe people shouldn't be able to overwrite their notes, and we don't really know that much about it. So we, we did this, um, I remember the conversation with the developers. When they first built the feature, they're you know, demoing it to the product team before we take it to the first group of customers. And I said, I see edit and delete there. Can we take those out? And they said, well, no, you're going to need that. We got, it, we got it for free. We'd already built it. it, it it's just going to work. For, just leave it in there. Why would we take that out? That's silly. I said, well, I want to have a very uncomfortable conversation with a customer about why they want to edit and delete. Are they just editing and deleting their own? Are they editing and deleting someone else's? I need to have those conversations. And if I give them the feature, I'm going to bias that conversation. If I don't give it to them, I'm going to have a very pure feedback loop. So when we first gave this like three to five customers, we did not want to give this to all 3,000 customers without those. We picked like three to five that we knew well. Uh, we did it without edit and delete. But we put a pendo guide up in the corner there that says share your feedback. We wanted to surface up the people who are going to be willing to talk to us. And you can tell based on the feedback, like, hey, you guys are idiots, you need to edit and delete. I'm probably not going to talk to that customer as quickly as I am the person who would say, it would be great to be able to edit my notes. And we actually saw people using this, and one of the first notes we saw was, be careful, cannot edit or delete. We called that customer, like, okay, well, let's talk about why. And the story was, people wanted to correct their typos. That's all it was. They knew that their colleagues would be looking at it, and if you were going quickly, you're on the phone, you have a typo, you just wanted to be able to clean it up. Okay, cool. Now we know the why, and we can build the little nuancy parts of that feature around that narrative. So that's part of our, our learn and iterate. When the little button that launches the guide, the first thing that we do is ask people how they're feeling about this update. We want to know if someone's thinking, hey, this is a four out of five and it's pretty good without editor delete, or is it a two? Like, is there a deal breaker missing feature? Is it not intuitive and that's causing a negative score? We want to ground our feedback in terms of how they are feeling. And then we're going to ask for that qualitative input to kind of guide us. There were a couple of things that came out of this. You know, task management was one idea. Um, I mentioned edit and delete. The thing that really um, we put into action immediately came from this comment. Would be powerful to have something display on the main profile screen indicating there's a note for this member. And that's another one. You read this and you think notification and we're almost all hardwired to say, okay, notification. It should be like my phone. When I read the update, the notification goes away, so I'm always aware of when there's a new notification. And as a product team, that's just where our heads went. When we actually started calling people and talking to them, it was more binary than that. They wanted to be able to know if there was a note or not, so before they answered the phone, they could see what someone said. And if that notification had gone away, they'd be flying blind when they're answering the phone. So they wanted a persistent notification and they wanted to know how many notes there had been so that they were better equipped before they engaged with those people. It takes, um, it's, it's, a, it's fun to go through that process, but it's also really painstaking because you wanna build the, the cool things, you wanna build the sexy things, you wanna build the, the headline news things. You don't wanna spend a week deciding what your 
profile notification is going to look like? Is it going to be a dot or a number? But when you dedicate that ty type of time to it, you bring home that empathy and you complete that narrative for your customers and you end up with much more successful launches. Not because of some grandiose vision, but by taking the time to get to know your customers really, really well and building simple things that, in our world, bring them refreshment. The other thing it does, uh, who has ever been a little stressed out on launch day? <laughs> right? Stupid question, my bad. Um, when I, when I first started at MemberClicks, um, I started in sales. That didn't work out. I'm not a good salesperson, uh, but they were kind enough to move me over to the support and uh, customer success team. And I remember at the time we were doing quarterly releases, and I remember coming into the office at like 4 in the morning. The code had just been finished pushing to production around 3 a.m. And I was from 4 a.m. to 9 a.m., uh, my colleague Jeff and I, we would come in and we would just test and we would try to report all the bugs that we possibly could because we knew what kind of day we were gonna have if we didn't get ahead of it. So really, really stressful experience on launch day and I think some of that has kind of biased our process now because maybe I overcorrect for that a little bit. But on launch day, because we know the customer stories so well and we've built the feature to those narratives, launch day is like stress-free. On launch day, for us, there's this, a, um, we've been using the term feature flagging. Uh, we call it feature toggling in the office. But for us on launch day, because we've gotten so much input through the Pendo process, for us launch day is just enabling the feature for all of our customers. No code actually gets committed on launch day. So that de-escalates the stress. But we also know how to market it. Because through that alpha, beta process, getting feedback all the time, we know what people are excited about. We've had so many conversations with customers that when you actually get to launch, it's like a sure thing. And on some level, it's a little anticlimactic because you already know how it's gonna go. But it typically goes really, really well. So when we launched uh, that profile notes feature, we left the Pendo guide up to give us feedback. And these are some of the comments we got. And it was really, really exciting for us but it was also really, really exciting for our team. One of the things that we've really worked at is bringing more um, humanity to our process. There's so much data and there's, there's so much data and there's so much noise. It's really, really easy to forget about the people using our product. And so we've worked really hard to bring the relationships at the forefront of our minds. And when we go through launch, we get all of that feedback. And then we've started doing, uh, sometimes it's a week later, sometimes it's two weeks later, sometimes it's a month later, just depending on what that feature is. Um, we've taken the idea of uh, Lunch and Learn, and we've transitioned it to Launch and Learn. So we'll launch the feature, and whatever that time increment it is for us to get the feedback, we'll get the whole engineering team together, and the product team will give the report to the engineering team, how's it going? Are people using it? Are they liking it? What's our adoption rate? And it closes the loop in terms of did we hit our marks? You know, Todd was talking about goal tracking this morning. And we don't set too hard of goals, but we set the trends of what we want to see based on what it is. Some features we know are going to have a longer tail of adoption just by the nature of changing the user's habit. Others, right off the bat, you know, we know it's going to be a home run. So this is a different example. Uh, this is what we call archiving forms. In our product, we do a lot of online forms. And so we have this feature called the forms list. And the forms list holds membership applications, dues renewals, conference registrations, surveys, contact us forms, all of this stuff. And as you would imagine, that list gets really long over time. So the pain of having this ever-growing list came out in our qualitative feedback. And we start looking at people's sites, and we're seeing things like ZZZ, 2015 membership application form. ZZZ, 2016 conference registration. And all people were doing was naming it ZZZ to get it to the bottom of the list, right? Pretty clever. I don't know why we didn't think of that ourselves. Um, but the feedback that we had gotten from customers was, I need folders. And so we're seeing these two things. We're saying, well, you don't really need folders. You just need a way to not look at all of the old stuff because it's noise. So we came up with archive forms. And we went through that process, and when we launched it, we saw, this is actually an excerpt from one of our launch and learns, 
but we saw adoption right off the bat. We were really, really happy with that, and then we saw it you know, kind of uh, stay consistent over a, a period of time. So we felt really, really good about that one. It really is about, and you, and you lose track of it, but it really is about those human connections and driving those emotions and those types of reactions. That was not a hard feature for us to build, but had we just lived in the data, we never would have done it because there was no way we could have justified it. It had never been important, but as we talked to people, we, you know, we couldn't live without it, and we, we really closed the loop on delivering value to our customers. The other thing that we do that I, I'm not going to show is we also do video clips of the feedback that wasn't so well, you know, more the constructive feedback, and we always try to loop with, okay, did we do the thing that we set out to do? Okay, well, what are our next steps based on what people are telling us? It might not come right away, but you know, six, eight months later, a year later, whatever's appropriate, uh, we're going to do those next things. So in this case, they, they did want folders. We're going to give them labels. So we have, we've been with Pendo for almost two years, and we have changed our processes quite a bit, and we have used the product immediately on the product team, and more recently, customer success is starting to use it, and onboarding it ha is using it as well. All of us are, are using it heavily to facilitate feedback. That is like the number one thing for us. We do transactional NPS as part of onboarding. We do more of an experience NPS. We do a product NPS. And we do all of the polls and the surveys so that we can get to know our customers better. I'm not saying, like we've had a lot of success over the past two years and like, the product process is a part of that. There's a lot of things that go into any organization's success. But the more of the, the ecosystem around customer centricity that we're able to create, the more we turn that flywheel. So in closing, I think um, you know, Wade hit on it pretty well this morning. Uh, the people who understand the customer the best typically win. And I'm a pretty altruistic person, so for me, winning is not only the company having success, but also the customer having success, and all the stakeholders in our little world having a little bit more ex success and a better experience. So we are using Pendo to facilitate better conversations, to get better feedback, to validate that we're actually setting out to do the things that we want to do. And we've been able to scale this process from a company of 50 people and one product manager to 120 people with seven product managers. It really has worked well. So I would encourage everyone, if you're not using the polls or if you're in this world of, no, the science isn't right behind NPS, I would say try it because I think it's something is better than nothing. And if you don't think about it as being like the end all be all metric, Think of it as just a way to start a conversation so that you get to know your customers a little bit better. Any questions? How long after you the team? Really good question. It depends on the feature. Um, some things, when we see that immediate adoption, we'll try to do it within two weeks. Other things that have a longer tail of adoption, we'll do it a month or six weeks later. We try to do it as quickly as we can so that all of the process is still top of mind for the team. Good question. Yeah, good question. Um, it's kind of tough to answer without um, you know, getting like too specific into our product, but one of the um, systems that we've put around sharing the roadmap is making sure that we're getting people in front of it and making sure that's easy for people to give feedback about the roadmap. So when we get feedback, and it, it kind of, we have a very engaged customer base, we're very fortunate that way, it kind of streams in. And so we're able to say, when, when we put something on there and we're getting the positive feedback, that's good validation. When we're putting something on there and we're not getting positive feedback, it's like, ooh, Maybe we need to take a step back and deprioritize that one. Uh, we're pretty active. We use ProdPad for most of this, um, but we'll put the ideas that we're evaluating out. And actually, let me go to the slide so you can see it. Yeah. So we're pretty transparent about what telling people what we're thinking about versus what we're working on versus what is just kind of a blue sky, hey, maybe someday. So you see the top of our columns in progress. That means we're actually coding. 
researching means we're being very intentional about validating the idea and fleshing out the requirements and really thinking about what is that smallest iteration that we can build. And then future considerations, it's like cool stuff that's on our mind, right? And we, we want to more passively gather information. We are um, very, uh, my boss says I'm, I'm dogmatic about it, but we do not commit to features at any level. Not to the board, not, I report directly to the CEO. Mark does not know what features we're gonna be working on. He knows what problems that we're thinking about solving. And over the course of four years, he's become comfortable with that, kind of begrudgingly. It's been a journey. Um, he would tell you that we've only changed because I'm the most stubborn person he's ever met. I would tell you I'm perseverant, but it's just kind of tomato, tomato. Um, so this changes all the time, to answer your question. On the right. Yeah, good question. So we tried to be a little bit too perfect out of the gate, just you know, in our nomenclature, for example, how we labeled features, how we labeled pages, how we labeled groups. Um, we didn't really learn until we took the first step, so I think we wasted some time being a little too, an too analytical up front and trying to stay organized. What we learned, though, is that it's very forgiving. If I want to change the, fe uh, the feature name, or if I want to change the group assignments, it's so easy for us to do. I wish I hadn't spent the time overthinking it in the start. You know, the last one you were asking for was, I think, was risk of four. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you see that again, it seemed like one day users woke up and they started using it. Like, I see that it's not this one, but everyone else. Like, what's changed? Why is there a big jump? Like, is it a thing that's slowly creeping? Yeah, so that was actually launch day. So this is where we had a very select few customers using the product, and this is where we gave it to everyone. So in this particular example, it was archiving forms. So people had this long list of forms, and so they had a lot of noise to clear out. Yeah, totally. That probably would have been good for me to explain, huh? Yeah, yeah. That's good feedback, Mike. Thank you. Yes, we did. Um, we put it, whenever we do feature announcements, we do use the what's new part of the Guide Center. And that does OK for us. Where we've seen the most success is putting a little banner um, announcement on that particular page where the feature lives. And that way, people get it when it's contextually relevant to them. We've had a lot more success doing it that way. That's an area that we could probably improve in, to be honest. Uh, we, do, we do do it all ourselves, and we do it by committee. Um, one of the things that I've neglected to put a good process around is, it used to be just me, so I would just get with a UX designer and we'd hammer through it, and now we have seven people taking that same approach. So we kind of step on each other's toes a little bit, or not all, we're not always aware of um, all the learnings that everyone else has had. So right now it is the product managers and the UX designers collaborating to publish things. We also have a small contingent in customer service to announce webinars and, and other sorts of things. It's kind of like gambling, right? <laughs> it is. Um, yeah, I th that's what this conference is all about, right? It should be very cathartic. Um, our process is to, I'm not big on the scoring rubrics, right? I think that that is just easily gamed. Like if I, in my gut, want something, I'm gonna score it so we get it. Um, but what we do do really, really methodically is make sure that we are talking about our ideas with our customers and then kind of putting it on them. Is this, if you, were, if you had my job, is this what you would work on? Right, and those types of questions help validate your thinking. And that doesn't help us say, hey, this is the perfect decision, this is the absolute best thing we could do, but it gets us you know, in the top 20% of things, and I think that's really all you can ask for.
question. So, in that text above it, in that second paragraph, it says, got feedback, let us know. That links out to our feedback portal. So we're, we're collecting it passively that way, and people are more than happy to tell us what they think about our roadmap, but we're also steering people to this when we're on calls, and our support team is steering people to this on calls, and our customer success team is steering people to this when we're on calls. So it's really a collective effort to validate the roadmap. This is a Pendo guide where we've iframed in the roadmap that is hosted by ProdPad. It goes to ProdPad's feedback portal. Yep. Mm -hmm. You got yeah. It's kind of a that kind of situation. Yeah. Yes. So I think this is actually number of accounts, first thing. So it's not a percentage. Um, so that's an important note. But uh, we had the same questions. And we kind of thought to ourselves, based on our conversations, people tend to organize on a monthly cadence or on a quarterly cadence. So we, our expectation was that we'd see an uptick at the end of the month or at the beginning of the month, or we'd see an uptick at the end of the quarter or at the beginning of the quarter. That's proven not to be true. But when we look at the percentage of accounts using it over a six-month period, we're north of 80%, and that's good enough for me. So I'm not so concerned about saying, hey, everyone has to use it. If 80% of our customers are feeling like they're more organized because they can archive forms, I'm really, really happy with that. That was the actual score, and we started pretty low, so, you know, statistics can lie. <laughs> no, we went, um, our first go around by doing NPS in-app, we were like right at a zero, and then the next year we were, um, we ended the year, I think about an eight, and then this year we've been 24 to 30, it's still early in the year, but yeah. Which one? Really good question. So what we've learned is that there are kind of two things. If we're, if a feature that we launch is not getting the adoption that we expect, it's typically one of two problems. It's either people don't know about it or people don't like it. And so we will talk to people who are using it and we'll find out why they like it and we'll put that message out to see if that can increase adoption. Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. We'll talk to the people who aren't using it and find out why and then try to tweak the feature. But we always try to start with communication first, because that's typically a much lighter lift than changing the feature. The marketing of the feature we do use Pendo for heavily. So we'll do a reminder to people on the page. Yeah, we'll, guides set as reminders to people who haven't used it. Yeah, yep. Pretty much all of our feature marketing has moved in-app in Pendo. That's like 80 to 90%. Yeah, so I kind of take that as a given, but uh, that's helpful for you guys to know that. <laughs> Yeah, it's a good question. Um, initially, and to be totally honest, like I'm just super stubborn. 
so like we were going to do that either way because it was the right thing to do. Um, there, there's no like two ways about it. If, if my boss Mark were here, he would like take 10 more minutes to explain that. Um, but what we did that's been more important for the cultural change is talk about the impact that that has made and how it's fueled NPS and how it's fueled sales and how it's fueled retention. And that's created the buy-in, but we needed to take the first step to create that buy-in because it's tough to make that argument when there's a lot of cool new stuff on the roadmap. So right now, we only use Pendo for the administrators, so our direct customers. Um, we don't use it for our customers' members. Yeah. Can you elaborate on whether or not you plan on using Pendo for your customer testing? No current plans, but much like the roadmap, it's something that we need to evaluate. Um, for us, there's a little bit of um, a scale issue there. You know, we have like five to 6,000 administrators and we've got 10 to 15 million end users. So it, it, it would really change the world quite a bit for us. Um, where we focus to date is the information that we get from our direct customers about their customers. And that guides a lot of our road mapping decisions and that kind of we're, we're a little bit dependent on them to facilitate the roadmap. Uh, so that's how we've been handling it to date, but I think there's a lot more that we could do there. I think we got them all. Um, I'm up here if you guys want to chat afterwards. Thank you very much. <laughs>